Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Fandom Analytics webinar series brought to you by the Emory Marketing Analytics Center. So as always, so th this one is a little bit different in a very interesting and in a very good way. So as always, our focus at, in the webinar series is to bring you guys stories, bring you guys interesting people that are working in, in arenas where customer passion is just off the charts. So, so the idea of, you know, marketing's goal is to create something more than just customer preference to create fans. And so we are joined by Ann and Sid Mashburn. Uh, I think of them as local in Atlanta, though I think they're much more nationwide at, at this point. Um, by way of introduction, and this one's almost, um, I sort of went back and forth on how to introduce uh, Ann and Sid. Um, I think they do, frankly, I'll start out as a little bit of a, a fan myself. I think they do absolutely amazing, amazing work in the retail and the fashion space. They, um, they have created a, I think, unique lifestyle and customer experience that truly resonates with, with consumers. Okay? Um, in terms of their background, um, Sid came up as a designer working at places like J. Crew. Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfigler, Anne came up on the editorial side. When I had her in, in class years ago, I think you described yourself as having the assistance job in the Devil Wears Prada yeah, that film. Right. Yes. So she worked at Vogue and Glamour. Uh, I mentioned that Anne and Sid have gone nationwide. They've got locations in Atlanta, Houston, DC, uh, Dallas and LA also a vibrant e-commerce site. Doug can put the, we'll put the website in the, in the chat or the, the Q&A, wherever it actually belongs. Um, amazing coverage in the press, uh, Esquire, GQ, Southern Living, Vogue, Wall Street Journal. So really spectacular stuff. Now, the other reason I really want to have Ann and Sid on the, the webinar series is I had them to class, and I, I hope they remember this. I, I think it was about five, six years ago at this yeah. point. And truly a special visit coming in to talk to the, it was an MBA group at, at Emory. And I describe you guys, to, and not to put you on the spot, but I almost describe you guys as artists who found your way into marketing. In terms of, it, it's a very kind of, it's a sensibility that's very, I think starts with the, the core of what you guys do, fashion, journalism, and ends up being translated to an incredibly powerful and incredibly strong brand. So with that, welcome, Ann and Sid. Thank you so Thank much. You. That's, That's very, nice very, intro. very kind of you. That was, that, we had a great time at that, that day at Emory. It was a great group. <laughs> okay, so to start things off, I will tell you guys this. And again, sort of further, kind of some individual stuff. I first encountered you guys via some web searches when I moved to Atlanta. I was looking for a, a suit and I discovered style forums online, something I had no idea existed. And the sort of the, the, the view of the, the people on the forums was if you needed a suit, go see Sid, go see Sid Mashburn. Um, I went to see you and, you know, really enjoyed the, the experience, but it really struck with me the amount of enthusiasm you had been able to create in these online spaces. And so how did you guys go about creating, and I, in a way, I don't want to call this a brand, but how did you guys go about creating this brand, this, this entity? Well, we're, first of all, we're, we're very fortunate, but, you know, I, I, I grew up, my family was in the retail business. I started working in a men's clothing store when I was 15 years old. Anne came from a family that her father was in retail for 40 years. I think if you would have told us or asked us early on, like when we were coming out of college, if we would ever do retail, we would have both been like, what, why, why would we do that? And so um, I was at uh, Ole Miss and I, I wanted to go to fashion school in New York and my dad looked at me like I had, you know, eight, eight eyes and said, son, I'll help you finish regular school and then you can do whatever you'd like. And so sure enough, as soon as I finished, he said, why don't you go to New York and see if you can figure this fashion thing out. And so I went and I tried to get into fashion school and they said, you're going to have to start over, all over. And so I was working retail at the time. And then I met Ann at the beach one day. It was a great day at the beach. 
And um, sure enough, she was, like you said, she was working at Vogue. And uh, we became very, very fast friends and got married about two and a half years later. But uh, I was working at the time in um, wholesale. So I'd moved from retail to wholesale. And that's the big move, was to move from working on the shop floor to selling to these stores. And in this, this opportunity, I, um, the owner taught me how to design clothes, basically. And I'd grown up being around product my whole life. So anyway, we, um, uh, Ann uh, and I got married and I went on to work um, at J. Crew. I was the first menswear designer at J. Crew. Uh, Ann worked at J. Crew and doing editorial work, but she had also at this point moved on to Glamour magazine from Vogue. And um, then I went to, I got the opportunity to go work for Ralph Lauren. And that's a little bit like getting tapped by George Steinbrenner, mm. you know, to come play for the Yankees. And I realized I was a, a much uh, better and more agile fish at J. Crew than I was at Polo. Uh, but I, I learned a whole lot about really finesse and, and sort of the nuance of design that, that at J. Crew you didn't really necessarily have the opportunity to do. So that and um, then went to work for um, – Tommy Hill figured and ultimately got called to go work for Land's End in Wisconsin. And so I had the benefit of working in a couple of direct to consumer um, companies, J. Crew and Land's End, but also working in two of the greatest wholesale brands ever, Polo and, and, and uh, Tommy Hill figure in design. So. Um, well, so I, um, going back to your question, when we came here, we were in our mid forties and had all this really great experience from, you know, mostly New York, but um, so we were at a place in our careers where we really knew what we were doing. Um, and we took a chance. We said, you know, let's start. So this is all we had, had always wanted to do this. So we chose Atlanta um, out of many different cities. One big reason was because it was not New York and it was frankly more affordable for us to set up shop here. There was also an awesome airport and we knew we were going to be doing a lot of work in Europe. But when we we did not have a marketing plan i will tell you that okay we had a plan to just get it to the next week i mean when you're you know you signed a lease you he went off to europe he started getting you know making clothes but when we opened the shop we filled it with we made it look like us and we told a story visually with of course, the clothes. I mean, Sid has a very specific point of view. So he was not opening a shop to speak to every man. He was opening a shop to speak to men who liked what he liked. And that was it, okay? So I think focus was really important for us. One small thing we did that is, is you know, we've done it in all of our stores, but um, I, I know Sid so well. And one of the things uh, when I would go visit him in his office, he always had a really cool desk with little bits and bobs behind it that really talked, it was just stuff he stuck up, okay? Really actually, we have one thing right now, it's too full, but. Um, so when we, we didn't know anybody in Atlanta, we knew no one. And I said, they're not gonna get Sid unless I, I'm gonna make a board for Sid and I'm, this is gonna look like Sid and it had some pictures of, like very small family pictures or like Dr. J Abdul Jabbar. Yeah. I don't know. Just, you know, stuff that Kurt was Flood. that showed his masculinity, but also showed his sense of design. I mean, maybe it's filled with artists and athletes and, but you looked at that and you were interested. You're like, well, who is this guy? So I think we told a story. We put, ended up, you know, we were on everything was a little on the cheap because it was that we were investing our own money. So I put in, you know, Half the furniture in the store came from previous homes and apartments. And so if somebody walks in the store, they get a feeling. So I think the thing that we did that was best, besides the amazing clothes, was just we made a place where we thought people would want to be. And then that would prompt them to want to buy. And we wanted them to feel welcome, like, okay, if you like this stuff, you're going to like it here a lot. And you're going to keep coming back. So I wouldn't say, I think it was a, it was never a plan. It just was how we set to be and, and um it's important to say too that this was before we opened a website i mean there were har hardly anybody was doing websites so there was no e-commerce there was no instagram i mean there was nothing to express who you were other than doing it every day and you know because we weren't buying advertising in magazines we weren't you know we got a lot of great press based on our backgrounds and the other thing that was really helpful 
helpful, and sorry, it's a really long answer, is that <laughs> Sid hit the real beginning of the menswear thing. So style form, which you found, probably didn't exist for very many years, if at all before that. I mean, this was- It was still pretty nascent. Yeah, lots of men were like, whoa, I get to look at clothes now, and it's, and it's kind of like, you know, I guess it's metrosexual. It's not so, like, it's for all men. It's okay to care about what you look like now. And so I think that that really helped juice things because he had a lot of fans from that world because of his heritage and his taste level and all this other stuff. So anyway, so I'll I think we told the story. There's, there's the story. two other things I think that were, that were pretty sticky. One was um, the idea of bringing our home into the store extended beyond just what our decorations were, but also just the, the general sort of vibe that we wanted to create in there. We wanted it to feel like our home. So when you walked in, you want a Coke, you want a beer, you want a coffee, make yourself at home. It was never like, like what can we help you find today? Now, on the other hand, you have to you, you have to have the EQ quickly to go, this guy's in a hurry. I've got to go, uh, how can we help you, sir? So you're, you're kind of come into my house, make yourself at home, but if you need something, we're here to take care of you quickly. That and then the other sort of real, real, real sticky thing that we did is, is we took the tailor shop out of the basement or out of the back and brought it out onto the floor. Okay, so our, and we had a master tailor in the store. That's basically a guy that could look at you and Michael and say, uh, in about 25 seconds, he could cut a pattern for you. So that's how capable he was. So when guys from Atlanta who were wearing baggy clothes and pleats came in, they saw, you know, a couple of guys wearing clothes that appeared to be maybe too small or pants too short or, and they'd be like, be like, I don't know about this. And then they see the tailor shop and that there was work going on back there. And they're like, this is a different thing. This is not, you know, it was almost like a sartoria in Italy, you know, like a, like a real tailor shop. So anyway, it was a lot of, it was a confluence of a lot of things that came together to, to really make a nice stew. And Sid was in the shop then because he needed to be. And you know, business was quite slow at first, of course, but he was translating his point of view to the, not just the customers, but to the other sales associates. And they all started to speak the same language and really express. So I think that as, as me, I opened my business three years later to do the women's thing. And I was in my shop from the beginning. So you, you developed a, um, what it really was and then passed it down to that person and passed it to the next. And it's a hard scale, but we've, we've, we've done that. And I think we were just really sure of what we were. We weren't sure it was going to work, but we were really sure of what we wanted to do. And if it didn't work fine, he could go get another job. I could get a job, but we were very true to what we wanted to do and didn't really, you know, now it's been hard because you can go do this. You can go do this. As soon as you're successful, you get, you know, tempted to do a lot of other things, but I think in marketing or in life, just staying really clear on what you are, what you do best is going to resonate with people. Yeah. You know, I mean, listening to you too, and it, it, it almost makes me think that someone should write a Harvard business case about what you've done, because in a lot of ways, you guys are classic marketers, though I feel like you're coming at it from the opposite direction, right? So a lot of brands start with something glossy and they want to tell a story about it, where you guys took this, you guys had the story, and I think that's why you're so, it feels so authentic, perhaps, is the yeah. right word. It's true, and the, the joke of it is, is that over the years, we're always saying, you know, there was a while where we were interviewing a bunch of different marketing people, and Sid and I, after the interview, would look at each other and go, do we even know what marketing is? <laughs> like, you know, I guess we're doing it, but like, it was like they were speaking a different language. So I really. And, and that, listen, yeah. that, that's really saying that we didn't know that much about it. We were just doing what we knew how to do best. And all of a sudden it, it evolved into, here's what your marketing looks like. But I would also say that Sid worked for, he was the very first designer, for, menswear designer for J. Crew. That, that is a, you know, Harvard, uh, study because they were one of the first people who told a story visually in a huge way that romanticized, you know, it was just a pair of khakis. But oh my gosh, the, the love people have for that catalog in the 80s in their mailbox 
is you, you can't even like, I hear it all the time and people, oh my gosh, I stole my first barn jacket. And because they did that. And I, so I think that we, and Ralph Lauren, I mean, those people are storytellers and I worked at Vogue and it's just, so I think we didn't maybe know we were doing that, but we were because that's how we knew how to do things. And they did it, you know? Yeah. So. Okay. Now you, you guys already mentioned a little bit of this in terms of the, the store experience, but I think that's, that's part of it as well. So, so the, the brand kind of resonates in terms of what's going on, but <laughs> let me let me let me say it very directly so yeah i remember seeing the 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 tailor out there on the on the floor um you also have the smoothest salespeople i've ever encountered in retail yeah, well I'll, I'll tell you one reason they're smooth you go ahead well we don't we, we um we didn't ever incentivize them with with um commission so nobody needs to you know, that was really important in the beginning. And there's a lot to be said for motivating real salespeople with incentives. So, you know, it's something we're not always locked into. But in the beginning, I mean, Sid was worked in a bar. You, you tell them the, the pool tips yeah. idea. We, we yes. uh, uh, worked in a bar in uh, Oxford, Mississippi. So you can imagine that'd be pretty good to, to exist in Oxford. But it was, I think it may have been, it was one of the best bars there. And it was interesting, the guy that owned it, uh, would recruit from different social sets around campus for his waitresses and for his bartenders, and um, it was a it was a cast of uh, it was an it was a great 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 team, and and we were you couldn't get in at night every night almost, and so the the the, the team there worked off of an in, off of the pooled tips, so barbacks, waitresses, bussers, every you know everybody shared in what, what came at the end of the night and everybody took something home. And you know what he was, it also was a way to, to be a filter of who's actually going to work here. He had to have somebody who knew he couldn't take a smoke break at nine 30 cause that's when it's starting to pick up and you know, kegs need to happen, you know? And so we said, you know what, how do you, how do you really incentivize people on their success of the business as opposed to, making it commission based. And so anyway, and we've, we've, we've changed over the years. So we've got a little bit more of incentivized selling now that we're working on. Uh, and I think a mix of that is good, but our guys to get a new set of tires, they don't have to make, they don't have to sell a suit, you know, this afternoon to do that. So it's, um, I think that's helped. And they also, they have no compunction about saying, putting a jacket on and saying, no, that's not the right jacket. Okay. So they're, and they're all, you know, not, not just motivated, but encouraged to make sure that the customer looks like a million bucks. You're not here just to sell stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, that was definitely one of my, um, well, I, I've got two questions. So I'm just saying which one to go with. Um, I'm going to change direction, but I'm going to come back to this, the, the, the effectiveness and the salespeople in, in helping. But the other thing that struck me that you guys did that was very unique and definitely goes along this theme of, taking your customers and making them feel like this is something special, like right? that I'm almost like rooting for, I'm a Sid and Ann fan rather than just a customer, was the amount of editorial coverage. And I'm not even sure that that's the right word, but the amount of stuff that is in GQ yeah. and Vogue. There's a lot of that. And you know, we probably didn't put that out as much as we should have, you know, in the store to legitimize us in a way, because I think we were really, a bit shy about it. And, and so if I could change something, I probably would go back and make a bigger noise about the credit that we got because it was substantial. I mean, in the first year, Sid was in the New York Times, like a huge article written about it. I mean, it was just, but also we were able to get a lot of that again because of our, not just that we had some connections, but what would happen is if somebody reached out about the story, we would pitch it back to them in a way that we knew they would use our assets. We would send them more than they asked for, or we would just because we knew how to do that. So I think that helped. And we were yeah. so proud of what we had. We're like, well, we don't want to just send them a shirt, a picture. It's like, yeah. no, you got to get the whole Megillah, man. Yeah. You know, so we would overdo it. But and we, and interesting to Anne's point, we didn't, we were, you know, reluctant to pull the trumpets out amongst our, customers yeah. okay 
and really kind of pat ourselves on the back. But people but, like to see that. But if know? somebody came looking for a story, we, we'd pull out all the stops. And we also had confidence to know that there are not that many great stories out there. I mean, all those people in magazines and news, they are desperate to find something to talk about. And because, you know, we, we could have had so much more success if we were in New York, to be honest, because it's people, like the people who write about things, that's where they are. Plus the density there is but, pretty good. But it was also, again, the menswear boom going on. Also, these magazines and things, they were looking for outside of New York too. Okay, so GQ did a big party for Sid early on that was totally self-serving on their part because they needed to take pictures of a cool place in Atlanta to satisfy their advertisers, you know, focus group here or whatever. And, so and there's so it was, yeah. it was, it was uh, part of their southern strategy. Yeah, I mean they 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 admitted as such. It's like you know what we've got a dearth of customer. There's a customer opportunity down here that we've got to mine a little bit more, and you will be a great foundation to help us do that. And kind of knowing that, and also taking advantage of it, but not putting, not getting so proud that you're like, yeah, we're so cool. It was like, okay, let's make the most of GQ coming here. Let's just make it be great and then go back to work on Monday, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I, I need to, one small administrative point though for, for everyone watching, uh, please enter any questions and comments you have for, for, for Ann and Sid in the, in the Q&A feature. Um, Doug Battle, who I failed to introduce mm -hmm. at the top of your screen, Doug will curate the questions uh, throughout the webinar, and we'll circle back to those as we uh, as we get near the end. Okay, so the question that I I, I was at the, the the other question I had, and I don't even know how to ask this, so I'm going to stumble my way through it. But I have a feeling you, I don't know how to ask it, but I have a feeling you guys are going to know how to answer it. So you alluded to the the salespeople being very helpful to customers um, in terms of making them look good. One of the things I like about your place is that, and this is where I'm going to contradict myself. I, in a way, I don't have to think that you have made the key decisions. I'm, going to, I'm not going to make a mistake. But the other thing is that, and I'm going to point out something strange that I hadn't intended to, is that you guys also do this kind of education, which I think creates some sort of buy-in. And the thing that, you know, look, I had never thought about it, but these this issue of working buttonholes. Which you paid extra for. <laughs> right. And, but it was one of these moments where suddenly now if I see a suit jacket where the buttonholes don't work, that now seems strange to me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we spoiled you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you educated me. Yeah. But, but can I say something? This is what I think we did for you. We gave you a gift because every time you go like this, you, you know why you're doing that or you feel like you are doing something special. And every time you look at somebody else's suit, I mean, you're not looking down at them, but you're like, gosh, I'm so glad I know that now. You know, so it's that's the after thing that you get. You make the purchase, you wear it, but that's something that you, it's inside and we helped you know that, so. And, and basically yeah. what, what, we're, what I, I like to think that we're in the business of doing is, is how do we help a person when they come in the store, how do we help them leave feeling better? Not just because they purchased, but like even if they didn't purchase, how do we lift them up a little bit? And how do we celebrate them? And because in a sense, most everybody that crosses the threshold is looking for confidence, you know? And confidence, they'll pay for confidence, uh, but at the same time, they don't have to pay for confidence because we're gonna probably find a way to encourage them in some way either by just being nice or offering them a cold Coke or a, uh, you know, a beer or something, just something that we say, if somebody's invested enough to come across our threshold, what can we give them as a gift for their exit? One thing also, I think that, and I have no data on this, but I think men like to know the details and they like, you know, to have the hood popped. Like they, some men love to know that stuff. I have found that for me, women and me, I don't really care that much. I just want it to look awesome. And I do like, I, we make beautiful things and I like to notice that the inside is as nice as the outside and all that, but I don't, um, 
my customers, so we tell a story and educate men about why they should like X, Y, Z. And there are only a few things because Sid has done the heavy lift. He always says you don't need a lot of choices, but you need the right ones. But women love a story that has like a little bit of romance or context in it. Like, oh my gosh, you, you have to have this shoe because this shoe is like, all the women in Paris wear a shoe like this because they walk on the street so much, and but they want to look like a girl. They would never wear sneakers. And you should think about yourself as a French girl when you wear this shoe. And you know, she no, but yeah. she she so romanticizes and not and not as a seller, as of that's what she's thinking. Anne is is constantly thinking of the story and putting herself in this position of, wow. I'm in Saint Germain running around with these uh, buckle shoes on and God, I feel great. I feel kicky. I feel, I feel rich. So the stories are different, but it's, it's, you know, and that was also because I was in the store every day. So I would, I would, I knew I wasn't a design. I mean, Sid has this amazing design background. I was a fashion editor. I do not know the first sample that comes in a fit. I always think is fine and it's not. So I am, I need my design team to make everything better. But I know I want to wear it, and I know why I want to wear it. So I was a fashion editor, so I thought, okay, I'll go to market telling people that. Like, you are going to have a fashion editor's perspective. She's only going to tell you what you absolutely need, or even if you don't really need it, it's so fanciful that you are going to, you want it really badly. Or um, So I had the idea I wanted to educate women about the same type of things, but just make them feel really um, happy about something because it's going to delight them when they wear it and why. And she writes about this bi-weekly in, in, in a column uh, called You Need This, I Promise. And it is so good. And every week, you know, she's got loads of listeners or lo loads readers. of followers, readers that, that want to understand what is it that I need? Well, so that, that was a big marketing initiative. And actually that was marketing. But what happened was I wasn't in the store anymore to, to talk about things like that. And, you know, because we started building this big company. So I thought, I know that women respond to this. So if I go and say, this is why you need a white shirt. And then you can, you know, with the internet, you can show beautiful images. So I write and it's my voice. And so every two weeks I do this thing, but it is, it started as kind of a labor of love because I had originally wanted to write a book and then it couldn't get off the ground. So I was like, okay, I'll just write it and put it on the web. But then it just, now it is such a revenue driver in a really great way. I mean, I, I love it, but women, you know, just talking about fans, like women really feel like they know me. They, they love wearing things that I've told them about because I've opened up my personal life to them. Not, not, I mean, just, she, she's a, she's yeah. their friend and, that, and that's the other thing about when you come into our store because i think alex and nick probably helped you the most in the past you know guys are look everybody's always looking for a friend particularly a friend that you can trust their advice rely on what they're saying and know that you're not getting sold and so it, it, and, and i have to say something the customer service piece for us can sound magnanimous it's not always so magnanimous mm -hmm. It is self-serving. It's almost selfish on our part because of the return we get on that investment, not the financial, the emotional return. Because it feels good to take care of people. And when you have somebody that's leaving out with a new suit and they're, they've got, they either have an interview ahead of them or a wedding ahead of them or, you know, God forbid a funeral ahead of them, but at least they feel taken care of walking out the door. And that is a powerful, powerful feeling for us. Um, and so, you're kind of a, you have a collection of friends that came about because they just needed a new shirt. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that by saying I, I do, I do remember Nick and Nick knows how to make friends very quickly. Yeah. Um, um, listening to you, uh, listen to you to talk through this. Um, it, it almost strikes me that you were uh, the beta version of what became the influencer on places like Instagram. You were just doing it in real life. You know, we have a really great guy who worked for us early on who came from McKinsey. And he kept pushing me. It was just when. Actually, though, hold on. His father had a dry cleaners. So he got to McKinsey because he was so dead gum scrappy. But, you know, he, he worked his way up through it. It wasn't like he just was one of the chosen guys that go to McKinsey. He was, <laughs> he'd been through it all. He was awesome. 
anyways, I'm sorry. So, no, 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 it's a good setup. So, but he kept pushing me to be that person. He's like, what, you're the influencer. You need to wear these clothes. You need to be, and it was just when Instagram started and I couldn't do it. I just thought, I can't do that. I cannot uh, expose myself like that. I feel like a bragger. I'm not a model. I'm just, you know, a mom and I have great taste, but I would never do that. I mean, he was so on it and I didn't open myself up to do some of this stuff until more recently, a few years ago when you could not do it. I mean, the economics of Instagram are crazy and you cannot not do it. So I said, okay, I'll try it just a little till I feel comfortable. And I still have a, like our oldest daughter works with us and she's my greatest editor and won't let me do anything that's over, you know, that's too much, but I just couldn't do it before, but that's exactly what we, we kind of are like people want that it's and it's really coming from the magazine world you know instead of reading an ad from chanel you really are more convinced if you can see a real person that you really like so i mean i'm not an influencer but you know you can be proud to be an influencer i guess if you weren't thinking aloud well, if you a- if you have a point of view and you just want to tell somebody you might not like what i like but if you like it, I will tell you how to get it so that, you know, I'll share it with you. And I think we, we uh, when we hire guys, you know, we're aspiring. We, we aspire to be kind of a cool neighbor. You know, the guy that you go, hey, by the way, what, what weed eater is that you're using? Or, or you know, <laughs> what axe are you chopping kindling with? Or, man, those shoes you were wearing at that party on Saturday night, what? What were those? You know, and but but we want to be able to be approachable enough and accessible enough that it's not like we're know it alls or anything. We're just like, oh man, you gotta check these shoes out. These are handmade in and they're hand sewn on the last. It's an unlined suede that is fantastic. And so that all all of that to say is is how do we just be a trusted advisor and 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 really first a friend and the guy that I grew up working for and in Mississippi, the first store I really worked in outside of my family's was in the, in the back in the uh, stock room was a big sign that said, first make a friend, then make a customer. And it's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's more fun that way too. Okay. So you mentioned something in there in terms of what ax are you using to chop kindling? I could be getting this wrong, but I'm pretty sure you also sell axes. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so let me ask the question in terms of, let's say, starting from clothing and some of the expansions that you've done to, and I, I, I don't know, you tell me how you think of it as, in terms of a lifestyle brand, but axes and fancy pens and you know, records. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so how do you go from clothing to lifestyle? I mean, I think we always had a store that felt like a lifestyle brand, again, because there were bits involved yeah. of things that could tell people who Sid was in the beginning. And, um, you know, in business, you have to stay in your lane. So we really, you know, produce the most profit from things that, that are clothing oriented. But a little bit of smattering of the other stuff help sell the other stuff Mm -hmm. so we love and also we just like that stuff like sid didn't want to just have a clothing line where he sold to other stores he wanted to have it in his place with his music with his stuff around that was really important and so uh, that is just how the brand evolved um and then because he likes cool stuff i mean he is a person i actually don't like to shop at all he loves to shop. shop. He will go and find, he has a nose to find the coolest old record store in any town or a place that sells, you know, he found, Axis. yeah, yeah. Axis, whatever. He okay. Just okay. That. okay, so Sid, how did you identify the axe that you were going to sell? Well, th- this is the thing is, is, is the guy that Ann was, was talking about. Actually, first of all, you kind of hang around with guys that are, of your ilk okay okay and other guys like i love i'm a budget audiophile i never had the dough to, to buy the really really fantastic stereo system but i love a tube amp i love turntables i love british speakers you know and so we even sold audio gear for a little while and we, we it was hard we, we yeah, it was not a great business <laughs> and all we were really trying to do was show guys 
you come to us in case you don't know where to go, but once you um, graduate from where we are, we're going to send you to the right place to get the right stereo equipment. But anyway, the, the point is, is the guy that, um, that Ann was talking about, uh, the, the friend of ours from St. Louis who grew up in the dry cleaners, he, he's a, uh, a prepper. He is a prepper. Like, <laughs> he, he, he was in the Navy and he was on a submarine and the guy likes to go camping. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, anyway, anyway, there's lots of good stories about him. He can, he's a chapter in the book for yeah. sure. Uh, but anyway, um, I said, how, how do we how do we do something where we can make make coffee? You know, we got one of those little Snow Peak, you know, butane burners, and you know, you with, a, with a with a Yeah, and then and then we kind of got around axes, and he said, well, you know, the best axe in the world is the Swedish axe, it's Gransfors Brook. I'm like, well, let's get it. And sure enough, this is crazy. And Doug, you might appreciate this. Have you ever heard of a guy named Mark Peoples from Birmingham? Name sounds so familiar. Yeah, anyway. He's got daughters here. He, this guy shows up in the story. He's a great, great guy. He looks like Grizzly Adams. And he looks like he definitely does not belong in a men's clothing store. But he had to really come because his, his daughter was getting married. But he walks up to the axes. He's like, where'd you get these axes? I said, well, we have a place. He says, buy them directly from Sweden? And I kind of whip flash. I'm like, Sweden? How do you know about the Sweden and axes? He's like, I've got every one of the axes. <laughs> every one of them. So there's a guy that didn't belong in a clothing store, all of a sudden found like, this is my clothing store. So now I'm like, <laughs> that's cool. I they sell my store. axes, yeah, yeah. you know? So um, anyway, I'm sorry, Mark, if, if I've outed you as being an ax guy. But <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the point, and the other thing, there's two other things I think are, are good examples is one is that we we have these hand hand beaded belts from Africa that are kind of like Indian souvenir Indian belts or American uh, Native, Native American American. belts uh, that they used to sell at Stuckey's you know and they're they're very beautiful and very cool we're like that's a cool piece that you don't find in men's stores you don't even find them in the United States there's no place in the United States that sold them and then also we sell these African beads which are beautiful and they're cheap and they're cheerful. So the other thing is, is when you come in, well, I'm sorry, we also sell Levi's jeans. Levi's jeans are $65. No better men's specialty store in the country would ever sell a pair of Levi's. It's too cheap, it's not luxury, not you know high end enough. We're like, we wanna just get something for the guy that doesn't have a lot of shekels so he can shop with us too. Okay, so we, we really took the, the point of view that you know, if somebody from Mississippi shows up, they need to find something in here they can afford. And I wear Levi's, okay? So it's everything. Or Alabama. Or Alabama. <laughs> or Illinois. <laughs> or Illinois. Yes. Uh, yeah. so, but, but the thing is, is, seriously, it's like everybody's welcome. And it's a little bit, you know, on the men's side, it's a little bit like a fraternity where everybody can get a bid. You know, we're, that's, we want to help the guy who really doesn't feel good about coming in to figure out what he needs to wear. That's or women. I, I think that's and women too yeah. for sure as a matter of fact women as much or more than men so one of the things is is when we when we find guys that are working in our store we're kind of looking to fill out the the cast of um oceans 11. that's if we want we need don Cheadle, we need uh matt damon we need um uh, alan arkin and guess what? All those guys work on our floor right now. Okay, seriously. It's, it's not easy. Uh, it's, That's hard to it is hard to replicate, but basically that means when you walk in, you go, oh, that guy kind of looks like me. I think yeah, I'm going to go up to him. And so uh, they're, they're, we're looking for ways to lower the barrier to entry by just being welcoming. And because a men's clothing store can be very intimidating. And then one of the things is, it's like today, we, we're going to have the doors open on the store. Like, come in. This is this is not a fancy emporium. I mean, it is. It can be fancy, but it's not. It's not meant to be. So, sorry to prattle on. Yeah. Oh no, not yeah. at all. Changing directions a little bit. So, it's been a it's been a different kind of year, especially different for I think any of us that. And look, as, as a professor, in a way. I'm kind of in a performance-based industry. I think you guys have some aspects of performance. 
People are buying the clothing for their performances as they go out there. And so strangest year on record, you know, what, what are you guys thinking is next? Um, both for you guys as a retail space and in more generally, and I think this is what, I think everyone in the audience kind of wants to know what's going to happen to like business clothing when people, when people go back, what's the future look like? You know, we talk about this a lot, and I think we, we, well, first of all, we don't really know. No one knows. And if anything, this last year has taught us is that nobody knows anything. I mean, in the <laughs> fact, it can change. Um, but I, we're seeing business really picking up now uh, in a really marked way. So I do, you know, the economists will tell you that people have saved a lot of money. They definitely want to get out. But in terms of what people wear, I think that that it's that a lot of men are always, love dressing. They love suits. They love ties. I mean, Sid literally really has grown into feeling most comfortable in a tie. I mean, he really feels undressed if he doesn't wear one five days a week. Um, so that man is is going to uh, now start buying because he wasn't before. He didn't need anything. Um, and I think, but I do think that casualization is here to stay. I mean, really people have really gotten used to feeling more comfortable, stretch and all that stuff. So I see that. But I also see that people, it's huge opportunity because a lot of these clothes have yet to be made in a way that is both things, comfortable and really refined and something that you feel like a grown up in. And um, so lockdown I think is helpful for, for people to realize how important it is to dress and really what that does for your day to make that effort. So I see a huge opportunity. Sid um, speaks a lot about how a lot of people have fallen away. So, you know, we're, the competition is probably going to be a little tighter. It's, it, it it's, has, sad, it's but, narrowed yeah. a bit, but you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think the people that were probably most excited about uh, working from home were probably the, uh, the accountants in every firm because they're like, great, less real estate, less dollars per square foot that we have to spend. Um, it's not going to stay the way it has been where everybody's working from home, but it's probably not going back to where it was. And I'd say the same thing about clothes. If a guy dressed up five days a week, now he might be dressing up three days a week, but there's still going to be this desire to elevate yourself and up your game because you still have to perform and, and your clothes can be a, a big means of, of elevating your, your attitude and your feel of, 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 of what you do. So, um, and, and our, our real roles besides being friendly advisors is how do we help guys navigate the uncertainties of their wardrobe? Because they don't know when they're going back to work. They don't know if they're going back to work. They don't know what to wear when they win and if they go back to work. So we're, and we have definitely casualized our mix some, but we still have suits. I mean, and the way I look at suits, particularly our suits, we've always had a softer suit, uh, softer high quality suit. Many in the high quality don't go to soft, but there's soft ones that are of lower quality out there. But we've, we've continued to make something that's as good or better than what we've always made. And we've softened, and we've, we've reduced the amount of canvas in the jacket. And we made it so that the suit not only could be a seven day suit, but is a seven day suit. You know, like you literally can wear it. You know, like for instance, we're, uh, we're doing a campaign right now around our polo shirts. We've really pushed on making our polo shirts because our polo shirts are fantastic. They're, um, one of the ones we're gonna feature is this uh, prime Peruvian Pima PK. It's fantastic, but we will show it under a suit with sneakers. You know, the guy looks elevated, looks elegant, but he also looks, looks easy going, you know, so. You so, can take the jacket off after the Zoom call, and, you know. And so how do we, again, yeah. help guys, you know, uh, uh, really know how to, what to wear and when to wear? And that's, I think that's probably one of the, one of the real um, uh, edges we have in our shop is, is that the guys we have there are educated, know how to educate, and love to do that with the customers. I love that you use the term performance though, because in a way that is, you need to tell people that, you know, you need to, a young guy needs to know that if he is 
he's kind of performing everywhere he goes. Is he performing to get yeah. a date? Is he performing to get the job? Is he performing to get the tip? Is he, you know, whatever. It's just reality and that's okay, you know? Because we all need the accolades. <laughs> and the impetus, we all need the, the go to go there. Because you know what, left to our own devices, we'd all kind of push down a little bit. Hey, let me ask you one last quick question, then we'll switch over to the audience's questions. Um, and this is this is almost sort of a purely personal question. Um, the the move in your industry towards made to measure, or I think you call it made to measurement. Yeah. How does that fit in with the the type of branding you guys do? I think it's really one of the one of the additional services. It really kind of shows that we are a full service shop. And up until really the end of last year, I think that probably the biggest dearth of product in our stores was active wear and lounge wear. And we've upped that game a little bit going back to the, uh, really the second, uh, excuse me, third quarter of last year, we introduced sweatshirts and now we have a fantastic uh, sweat trouser. It's a, a Japanese French Terry, really good. The fit's awesome. Um, and so we've, um, we, we've really, worked hard to, to kind of make it such that that the um the, the guys can see opportunities to uh, let me go back the most expensive part of, of all of our lives right now is time so we wanted to make a one-stop shop we wanted to make it super easy to shop and try to take care of as many things as we can and one of the things we think about is 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 how do we how do we offer economy of mind time and money time is, is you come to our store, we've got an edited selection, we've got guys to help walk you through it quickly, and you can get in and out of the shop quickly because you probably have better, more fun things to do than shop for clothes. The, um, the mind is, is you don't need a lot of things, you just need a right, great, curated, edited collection of things. And then the money is, is we're direct to consumer. So we're trying, you know, for the most part, we still, we do some wholesale business, but our goal is, is not how do we make prices more expensive, but how do we keep the prices manageable and service a wide, a wide swath of the audience. So, so but made to measure was, was a lot of men want that extra attention. It makes them feel really good. Again, it delivers like your buttonholes after, you know, it's not just a shirt, it's their shirt and it fits them and it was made for them or they got to design it. They got to choose what they were going to, to do so i think if you are uh, you know if you like cars you like all kinds of cars if you like clothes you might like clothes way up here on this level and you might like you know sneakers down here but it's cooler for us to show it all and so we wanted to let people know that we know how to make the very best we have a master tailor who can make it exactly for you but we also you don't need that all the time or you you might maybe you do need it all the time but well, there's, Lots of different guys. So, there's three segments yeah. really in our stores is ready to wear, made to measure, and custom. custom okay. Yeah. And the ready to the ready to wear is just what's off the shelf, basically. And we think we do a pretty good edited collection of that. The made to measure It's hard to do it though. It's actually hard. Well, the made to measure is. Yeah, the, and yeah. custom. I mean and the custom. Yeah. But we the reason it's it's easier for us is is because we have a master tailor in every single store. And the factories we work with are small family factories where they make products, especially for us. So we build patterns ourselves, but they made to measure the next notch up. That would be, for instance, if you said, you know what, I really like that gray suit, but can I get that in green corduroy? We're like, yeah, we, we, we can make that for you in green corduroy. It's not off the shelf or off the rack, but we can make that. And he's a standard size. Custom is, is if you got a severe drop shoulder or your chest is much bigger than your shoulders are, or if your your midsection is much bigger than your upper section is, or vice versa, and it's really someone who's got some fit needs or wants something very, very, very in particular. So you need to learn how to make that suit for a man who's heavy. <laughs> what was that? Sorry, <laughs> scratch that. Okay, <laughs> That's, you don't need to hear that. Okay, and with that. Let's turn it over to the audience questions. So, Doug, what are the what are the questions? Yeah. Well, first off, lots of great feedback. Uh, I'm going to skip right to the questions, but Sid and Ann, uh, a lot of people are, are enjoying your customer service and and the clothes that you all provide and all the rest. But first question we have here: 
uh, asking how do you choose the brands that you collab with? Um, and is there something specific you look for? Well, we have to love it. I mean, if it's authentic and if we like the brand, then it, and it seems natural, we, we are always open to it, but it really has to be, you know, like, there's a couple years ago, people say, if you, what was your, what's your favorite? Like, what, who would you love to work with? You know, I mean, since one Adidas his whole life or, you know, so things that you have a, have you love. And then sometimes it's exciting to do things together if you can. Mm -hmm. and a, 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 a tough one to answer would be Levi's you see, because I could easily say, we don't want to sell something that, that um, is available everywhere. Right. The thing is, is Levi's is available at Sears and Kmart and on the lower end, but not for the product we buy, but not necessarily at the mid and the higher end. Mm -hmm. So we've taken something and said, you know what, we're going to elevate this and say, you know what, once you get this and you go into our tailor shop, we will taper these for you and charge you for that, but we will customize a pair of Levi's for you with a $30 upcharge. You can't get that anywhere in the world. Nowhere. So whatever we bring in we want to at least be able to put our twist on it uh, or our spin i i misunderstood i thought you meant like a true collab like designing something with a different partner but the things that we put in our shop yeah more like what you curate yeah what we curate. that's again from our you know we're both old now i mean things that we we love also things that are feeling especially on the women's side i like to add some things that are just feeling of the moment like i switch up my designers like and I have a certain look. I've designed a lot of different things, but it is very clearly my brand. But I like to dress in a lot of other ways too. Like I like a very romantic look, which I don't necessarily make that as much. So I like to sprinkle in other brands that are either super hot right now too, because I want women to know that I know what's cool right now, like a fashion editor would. So I add things like that that come and go, but it's just stuff we like. And, really. and that goes back to even the brands we grew up with, like Diodora and tree torn sneakers, perfect examples. Diodora was a sneaker that was worn by Bjorn Borg. Tree torn was a sneaker that was worn by Bjorn Borg. We love both of those. And also, they're not widely distributed. And see, but that story, like I wouldn't have known that. But if I would have gone in there and I, somebody told me that Diodora was, born, was worn by Bjorn Borg, I'd be like, oh, now I want it more because I love Bjorn Borg. <laughs> and, and knowing that it's not widely available. So that's what we look for some some kind of exclusivity that we might gin up in our own mind, you know, like the Levi's. Like that's not really that exclusive. But once we play with it, it gets exclusive. Right, right. Um, can you all talk about your e-commerce business and how you persevered through the pandemic? That's actually a great a great story. You go ahead. Well, the e-commerce is how we persevered through the pandemic. <laughs> I would we, had a, we would be out of business right now, a hundred percent. I mean, that business grew, it grew years. Like in, we would not have gotten to the exposure and levels of selling without the pandemic that we did in the time period that we did, because so many people who were not online customers became online customers during that time, which is awesome. Um, and we persevered like everybody else did with help with the loans from, from, the government to be honest and just figuring out how to you know really do business better with less and you know we are gratefully were in a position where we could accept hardly any sales I mean, we had to close the stores we had to let people go gratefully we've gotten a lot of that back and we're optimistic but you know retail restaurant i mean everything that's customer facing was just so effective and and it's it's hard and i think we're still not really as a company, I don't think we've recovered yet because we're all still distant. We're all not together and it, we're still managing through it. But yeah. it, it's, it was, I think that Sid and I personally got through it better because we knew we couldn't change very much. All we could do was every day make decisions that would get us through, but we didn't, we weren't responsible. I mean, as a business owner, I have, I really get upset about mistakes that I make out of either just stupid mistakes, laziness, whatever it was. I can really feel down about those things, but not about this because I, I just tried to manage through it. So. Yeah, and, and interestingly, we reopened in 2007. We knew early on we wanted to be, to have an e-commerce business. So we had a, 
we had a website and a splash page pretty early on. We didn't start doing commerce until 2010. 11. 11. 2011. And I'd come from a background, you know, lands in, I watched it grow, you know, six, seven, eight percent a year for my whole tenure there. So it was, it was probably 60% of the business by the time I left there. Um, but it, as Ann said, without that, uh, we really, we, we really, we've been in jeopardy of staying in business. And so we, uh, and we also increased our ad spend on e commerce, but it, it um, before before e-commerce uh, or before the COVID, the, the bricks and mortar were you know three quarters of our business, and e-commerce was you know a good portion of that business. Um, so it, it really uh, and, and women's actually uh, was the driver was was really the the bulk of the business. And women's does more business than men's online. So it, it was um, the e-commerce was critical to our success, and also it, there's a there's a great back and forth between the store and the e-commerce. They really are our top, five of our top e-commerce markets in the country are all in locations where we have stores, which almost could make you sound counterintuitive. You know, uh, our other top e-commerce market um, within those, the top six is New York City, where we don't have a store. Um, but we do trunk shows there. We, and so we travel there four times a year and set up um, for three days each time and, and invite local people to come uh, do made to measure custom. Um, just marketing wise, you might find this interesting, but we, we were really dependent on that email list to communicate everything and to just to, um, you know, it was such a time when people aren't, were on their phones. So it was this huge opportunity to tell your story. So our, you know, I had a creative, so we were so busy because it wasn't just that we were, trying to sell we were trying to tell people empathize with them say oh you know this is why we're doing what we're doing and it was very tricky challenging but it was really important and i think just again an opportunity to get really close to your customers great um i know we're crunched on time and one thing i definitely want to hit here before uh, we run out is somebody asked how do we subscribe to your blog that, that you were discussing earlier you're so nice um, you just, it's on the website. You have to go to, we're getting a new website. It's going to be even easier in like a month, but, um, on my website, it says editorial and it's called, you need this, I promise. And if you just go on the, you'll get an email if you subscribe to our email list and you say you want to. And also my Instagram, it's all, it's on my Instagram, which is at Ann Mashburn. Okay. So it's, um, yes. And, and then we, oh, thank you. We also have one because mine was very successful. We did it for Sid. This is called Hey Sid. So every other week, somebody asks a question, which you guys should write in questions, and Sid answers them. And it's a chance for his customers to get to know his voice, his point of view, you know, dive a little deeper on something kooky like tennis shoes or something, you know? So it's, good. it's fun. We enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so, so how do they ask questions? We've got so many questions here. I'm just trying to direct oh, people that way. You can also do that through Instagram. Okay. And on the Hey Sid column, on same thing on his website, if you just search for Hey Sid and it comes up, um, there's a place to send in questions. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And last question um, that we have time for out of this batch is, what is the best way to get started in the fashion industry, especially when competing with students from fashion focused universities? Ah, great answer. Great question. Because Sid did not go to fashion school. He oh, miss. took any job, <laughs> just get school. in the door and work really hard. So if you are hired, like we're hiring people now to, to steam clothes for us for the photo shoot. So if you're not too proud to steam clothes, just get in the door and get, work really hard. Get a job in a, in, a, yeah. in a clothing store or clothing company yeah. and get to work before everybody else does and leave after they leave and work like crazy while you're there. You yeah. got to love it because it's a hard business. If you don't love it, you'll get ground down like any other business, basically. <laughs> Scrappers and grinders. Fashion apply. school is awesome, though, but you do not have to go. If you want to learn, you can, you can figure it out. You can overcome yes. that. Yeah. Okay. All I'm going to say is, you know, thank you two so much. Uh, I, I knew this was going to be a great conversation, and you definitely delivered. Um, I'll put it out there for the, the folks. If they want to find you guys online, I just type 
Anne and Sid Mashburn. And, and right up. Comes right up. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I, but I will give you guys the, the, the last word. Is there anything they should be looking for from you guys as we move out of COVID into, I mean, I know you guys have expanded to all sorts of cities and lifestyle brands. Anything that is on the horizon? Um, no, just keeping on, keeping on. Stay, and stay, doing, you know, stay tuned. Yeah, we're really just trying to do what we do really well. And there's and the, lots of opportunity for that every day. There'll so. be some good stuff coming out of the kitchen. Yeah. Okay. So thanks everyone for attending. Thank really you, fun. Ann and Sid. Awesome, yeah, so, Doug. So, thank you yeah. so much. And I'll let Daisy know to, um, that I met you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay you'll take right, care. Bye-bye.